Hallie Caster Jane, and welcome to the Hallie Caster Jane Show, a podcast akin to the great salons of times past. Pour yourself a martini, grab a spot on your favorite sofa, and listen to the great artists, writers, politicians, and celebrities of her day discuss and debate the current political and economic scene, art and music, film, literature, or maybe talk about the newest trends in fashion, design, and haute cuisine. Whether it's the current political cocktail or the latest must-read award-winning book, we tackle all topics and like to stir and sometimes shake things up. On this episode of the Hallie Castle Jane Show, we begin with Podcast America, our weekly politics segment in which veteran White House correspondent Matthew Cooper and I slice and dice the current political landscape as we near November 6th and the midterm elections. And joining me in the second half hour is James Mustick, the author of 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, a life-changing list. Stay tuned and enjoy the Halley Caster Jane Show. Let's get to it. Journalist and veteran White House correspondent Matthew Cooper is known for his in-depth reporting and analysis from Washington, D.C. Mr. Cooper has worked for some of America's most prestigious magazines, including Time, Newsweek, The New Republic, National Journal, and U.S. News and World Report. He now serves as a contributing editor to Washingtonian Magazine. For the record, Cooper also earned national attention during the CIA leak case when he was held in contempt of court and threatened with imprisonment for his refusal to name his sources and to testify before the grand jury regarding the Valerie Plame CIA leak investigation, a case that went all the way to the Supreme Court. Mr. Cooper has appeared on 60 Minutes, Meet the Press, Hardball, The O'Reilly Factor, and This Week with George Stephanopoulos. He's covered Donald Trump extensively, his hard-hitting and insightful profiles of the Donald, always well worth the read. And now, from here until Election Day, Matt will be my co-host on our new segment, Podcast America. I hope you enjoy. Let's talk. So another week more crazy. There seems to be no crazy threshold in American politics anymore, Matt. It just goes on and on and bigger and more crazy. So where did we leave off last week? I was trying to remember. Okay, Cosby. Remember him? That seems like three years ago. Right. Um, right? Something about Trump mm-hmm. being laughed at at the U.N.? Yeah, uh, Trump laughed at at the U.N., right. right? Okay. And would Trump fire Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein Rosenstein? <laughs> yeah, that was a false alarm, at least for now. Yeah. Uh, the jury's still out on that. But breaking as we go to tape, according to the New York Times, Mr. Uh, Trump received $413 million in today's dollars from his father's real estate empire, much of it through tax dodges in the 1990s. I'm quoting the New York Times. Legal, illegal, will it mean anything? You know, here's my theory on this, Matt. His followers need the myth of Donald Trump. They need it. They don't care. What do you think? Uh, I certainly agree with that. Also, you know, with the statute of limitations passed on some of this stuff, it's, um, you know, it's going to be moot. Um, you know, I mean, that said, it's, it's, you know, it is a big chink in this image. Um, and, you know, potentially there's ground for some fraud lawsuits and some civil stuff. So, you know, that could keep it alive. But, you know, uh, we've now reached the point where things which we thought were disqualifying or uh, damning, um, you know, have become so commonplace that, you know, I'm not sure this will make a big difference. First of all, the people who matter for him, I was thinking about this. Tell me what you think about this. Aren't the people who are reading the New York Times? Aren't the people who are going to delve into a story like that? No, not so much. Right? And that's a problem because I think that's, you know, the elites are going after him, if you will, you know, us intellectual types. And it's going over those people's heads. I want I want to say one thing that's in there that I think could be made hay of for those people. And that is he tried to scam his own father and was removed as executor of the will. Yeah, that's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> you think? <laughs> Yeah, that sounds pretty bad. Yeah, and 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 to people, you know, in you know, in, in his constituency, that kind of thing is the kind of thing that would, you know, you know, 
possibly upset them. But okay, I just we had to run that through. We did it. So here we go. We could yeah. You know, now the if the sister more. was complaining about this or something, I think that would give it more edge. But um, well, as far as I'm concerned, the sister who's now a retired judge, who was in part of this, they just like um, they like crooked judges. And speaking of crooked judges, <laughs> <laughs> couldn't shouldn't call. Brett I would say he's crooked. I, I said I we should say that. say that he's crooked, but we don't know. Combustible. That too. Um, <laughs> pro, pro, perhaps prone to anger. I don't know. Um, let's talk this right. Yeah. I, well, here's where I was going to take you down the thing. I mean, you know, let's talk about the hearings because we didn't get a chance to do that. They happened after we talked last week. For my <laughs> mind, and then I'll turn it over yeah. to you. He's a partisan, and to the point of crazy partisan uh this thing with 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 judge his friend mark judge i, I wanted to yeah. talk to you about this because what what upset me the most at that hearing then a lot upset me but the thing when he when he went wackadoodle and he got so abusive he was verbally abusive to the senators and particularly to a female senator and maybe we shouldn't say that one or the other but it was i thought what we saw there was who mark judge called in the book bart of kavanaugh and that personality which he has wonderfully masked i think we got a look into the alter ego of brett kavanaugh who may be young ford or her then time name was Blazy, Christine Blazy, met that night. Go ahead. Right. Well, uh, look, we there's a lot we don't know about that night, and uh, but here's what what we do know is that he um, turned in a performance that was very angry. Uh, and now, obviously, his defenders are saying, "Look, if you were falsely accused, you'd be angry too." But this. This went far beyond, uh, you know, Clarence Thomas's uh, anger in the uh, 1991 Anita Hill hearing. Uh, Thomas never, you know, went after individual senators or was nearly as petulant. And, you know, it was just a level that people, you know, that you rarely see in public life. Um, and then, you know, I think that the bigger thing for him is is whether he's been uh, telling the truth or not, um, you know, about his level of drinking, about what he knew when, um, had he heard about the uh, Yale uh, accuser, Ms. Ramirez, only at the last minute, or had he and his friends been working yeah. that for some time? So, you know... Um, I don't know if we're ever going to get to the bottom of what happened um, on a summer's night 36 years ago, but I, I think there's certainly a lot for the committee to ponder from what we do know. Well, I think the point that I would make here is is that whatever got us to that hearing, Christine Ford and all the crap and yeah. the drinking and the this, that, and the other thing, and believe you me, I went to college, you went to college, I might have had a night or two, I'm sure you did too, but did you do that? Well, I'm a bad drinker, so I, I, I and not. But you know what drinker, I'm saying. So I'm a bad person. Yeah, but a task. But uh, yeah, no, of course. That's look clearly. Um, I mean, this was, was over involved. the top. This was clearly a, a you know a culture of drinking and and bragging about drinking and and um, you know it sounded like constant drinking and that's you know all those things tend to you know weight the scale in uh, in Blasey Ford's favor. I'm just saying, you know, with what the committee can actually deal with, is it possible they were lied to by Kavanaugh? It seems that way, for sure. What do you mean? Um, what do you mean? I'm not sure I understand. I mean, you know, the, I, we're not going to get a conclusive answer of whether I don't think that, her. Well, okay, I, and I, 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 of course, but I don't even think that's the issue. I think the issue that we get to, you know, uh, the past is prelude. This guy will lie, right. steal, cheat, cajole. Scream, rant, do whatever he has to do, and he did that. If you look at him and everything that he set up in that first interview at Fox that you and I did talk about, and you go to the the, the second interview 
whoa, 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 where's the, whoa, there's something weird going on there. And he completely, one, you know, he was a sweet little boy, and the next was, oh, yeah, I like beer, I like beer, I like, by the way, Saturday Night Live, wasn't that a pistol? Was that brilliant? That was funny. That, that was, was pretty Matt brilliant. Damon was good. Oh, um, my God. But you hear what I'm saying? To me now, no, it becomes, look, he really? is a liar. He doesn't belong on the court. He perjured himself. Well, that's, yeah, I mean, you know, perjury is a very specific thing. It's got to be relevant. Hard to prove. Well, it's got to be germane. You know, if you lie about, love, you know, whether you love your mother's cooking, it's not germane. Right. Um, it has to be germane and has to be deliberate. And, um, you know, that's that's what they're going to assess. Um, and we'll see if, you know, the, the few swing senators who are left are persuadable against him. You know, my guess is they're all going to leap together in one direction or another. Uh, I want to bring up Heidi Prisbola's uh, report on on the Debbie Ramirez thing. You, you mentioned yes. it briefly, but I think that that is pretty because that was first of all That's how did they how, yeah how did they know? So there's a leaker somewhere in all of this. Number two, right. he picked up the phone and he called and which is a no no, but it's 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 witness tampering. Yeah, I think um, you know for people who haven't followed it, the question had to be whether he was anticipating this claim by uh, Ms. Ramirez from Yale that he had uh, played a drinking game with her and some other students, that at some point he thrust his penis in her face. And, you know, he's, from what NBC News' Heidi Prisbala was reporting, Kavanaugh seemed to be not only aware of the charge earlier than he intimated testified. to the committee. He testified. Yeah, testified, but um, that he was actively, and through his... Um, Proxies was actively trying to tamp down the claim. So that's what Pris Bilal reported. Also, we had known that the two of them had crossed paths at a wedding about a decade ago, but we had more detail on that about the degree to which Ramirez, you know, tried to avoid him at the thing, was shook up by it. Then she had more about a, per, you know, another Yale who came forward who had uh, been quiet and felt really, you know, compelled to talk about all this. Um, so it was more, you know, that was, that was more on the bad news side of the ledger for, um, for Kavanaugh. Um, you know, I think the, the good news for him and the bad news, I think for everyone else is that the FBI seems to be missing a lot of these witnesses, you know, missing? The one that, I mean, the one that, NBC, <laughs> wait, 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 missing. <laughs> wait a minute. Well, I, want, I, want to, you know, I want, I want to bring yeah, I'm not letting you get away with the word, not because you said it, but because I think we need to discuss it because it's on my list of things to discuss. I mean, this is a scam investigation. No matter how they play it, spin it, yes, we are, yeah, I said that. The first three days, Matt, were useless, right? Because yeah. nothing was being done those first three days. And then the Dems come back after the weekend and, 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 uh, and flake and everybody freaks out and they go, oh, yeah, OK, now we're going to do it. And we find out just today they aren't going to investigate uh, or, or re uh, go further into uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Ford or um, anybody that she was uh, had on her witness list. And you know why. And that's because if they do her, they'll have to redo him. And this is a scam investigation, so they don't want to do that. That frosts me. Okay, you can take it from there. I'm sorry. (laughs) Well, yeah. What we know is a bunch of a bunch of people have come forward with with stories about Kavanaugh at Yale have said that while they try to contact the FBI to share their stories, um, they haven't been able to get through. No one's gotten back to them. They've been ignored and. you know, that's very concerning. It's supposed to be a thorough investigation. So that's that's a deep problem. Now, you know, the White House has claimed that the FBI is unfettered. Uh, I can't imagine that FBI Director Christopher Wray wants, um, you know, for his guys doing an investigation, then all kinds of stuff comes out two days later that his guys missed. Um, so I don't know what to make of it at the moment, but we do know the clock is ticking because while they gave it a week, they're really going to have to turn in their findings, you know. Well, Wall Street Journal just tomorrow. reported they're turning it in tomorrow. Yeah, I think they turn it in tomorrow and there's a day to kind of, you know, organize it and uh, present it and the committee had digest it. And, um, and they're not you know. making it public. So my question becomes, the Democrats see this completely stupid no leads followed, no, you know, no rat holes followed up, yada, yada, yada. And it's a sham. Are the Democrats going to say, okay, that's okay? Well, I don't think Chuck Schumer and the 40, you know, nine, 48 senators who are 
against Kavanaugh are going to complain. Uh, I mean, or, I mean, sure, I think they'll say that. Uh, they're going to say it's a problem. And you don't, uh, th- and you don't but think the question somebody is like what this... Is, yeah, the question gonna... is, what is Hyde Camp and, Ka- right. Hyde Camp and Manchin and... and uh, the girls. Flake and, and uh, yeah, Collins and Rakowski going to do. We got five in play. Uh, they need two to, to defeat this. Uh, your guess is as good as mine about how it's going to end. I could take a guess, but I don't know. Go ahead. <laughs> My guess is Murkowski's going to vote against, the rest are going to vote for, and um, Pence is going to break a 50 50 tie. You don't think but, Flake is going to st- see it through? I don't, think, I don't think he's there yet. Let me tell you what he, re- he said today. Quote. I was very troubled by the tone of the remark, Flake said, of Kavanaugh's testimony. The initial defense that Judge Kavanaugh gave was something like I told my wife I hoped I would sound I wouldn't sound that indignant if I felt that I was unjustly maligned. But then it went on. And the interaction with the members was sharp and partisan, and that concerns me. And I tell myself, you can give a little leeway because of what he's been through. On the other hand, we can't have this on the court. We simply can't. He said that today. Well, see, I guess it depends on the meaning of this, right? If if means he means a regular display of this kind of anger, sure. But if he means this as in this looming shadow, then he's against it. I, I just, you know, I've made so many wrong predictions here. I, I'm giving up trying to really <laughs> be confident. Hear, it's good to hear somebody else's thinking. I mean, I mean, just in the tea leaves, it looks like. Collins has been generally supportive of Kavanaugh. Uh, Manchin's been kind of both ways. Highcamp's been quiet. Murkowski more critical. And Flake uh, becoming more critical. So, you know, read it as you want. I just so let me know. say this about Heidi Highcamp. She is so far behind right now from something that I read this morning or this afternoon. Uh, she doesn't have a chance of winning. By the way, well, North Dakota has the highest, one of the highest uh, uh, incidences of uh, sexual assault of any state. I think Alaska, uh, Alaska's one, and then there are a few others, but it's... Well, they're both, you know, you got a lot of oil workers. A lot of time on your hands. And, yeah. Um, I mean, not to put a jar of oil workers, right, but, but I'm just know, saying. that is one thing they have in common. So um, if she votes for, uh, against him, what is she, I mean, you know, at that point, she goes well, out a yeah, hero. Maybe she, yeah, maybe she does what she does. I mean, I, I look. Mansion is seventy one. Collins is sixty five. You would you would hope they would kind of at this stage in their lives, not you know, well, ma- be that worried about well, the next reelection. Doesn't but, even matter because with Mansion, he's way ahead anyway. Yeah, and I don't think people in West Virginia, to be honest with you, I live there for how long, uh, are looking at the Supreme Court so much. And the next thing's going to come up, and the next thing, and they got five weeks before the election. And I think if yeah, yeah, I think Mansion's okay. I think Manchin's, either way, so he's I, got a lot to hang yeah. his hat on. I mean, right. you know. Um, so, so I think that those are things that uh, uh, certainly. Um, you know, it's not so bad. I also th- I, I, I started to ask you what you thought the Democrats would do, though, because if it, if they read this report and it really is empty and full of malarkey, how how much hay, political hay do they make out of it? Do they go to the people? Do they scream like banshees? Do I think they can scream. I don't know what their you know tactical legislative maneuver options well, I think are. It's I think they're de minimis. They're de minimis. So I, I think they can complain. You know, um, the Republicans will say it's sour grapes because they agreed to a week and it was a week. And what's, you know, they'll say, what's your problem? Except the Republicans and the Democrats asked for the week, not just Democrats. Right. Everybody asked for the week by the end. Yeah. But I'm saying, you know, you you use it for for the next five weeks to uh, gin up the base and get them angry as hell and say, you know, this is messed up. I I, I, just have to see who gets angrier. Is it, you know, if Brent Kavanaugh is sworn in on Saturday morning this week, um, is that going to fire up Democrats or are they just going to be depressed, you know, and vice versa? Are you kidding? Democratic women are out of their minds with this. And particularly after today, when the president literally made like women don't matter in this country at all, which, you know, a lot of us seem to think when he... Yeah, well, I was curious your take on this, this sort of, um, this line that like, uh, I mean, it's it's kind of ridiculous that men are, you know, men are in a lot of trouble and men need to be scared from false accusations, but... I, I think that 
Trump line is going to have a little more resonance than Democrats and liberals think. I think um, I think there's some families who worry about their kids being falsely accused of things. My, you know, the thought that ran through my head, Matt, was this. Trump and the entire Republican Party, the active members of the Republic, the old white, they, these people are stuck in the 1950s. And I have news for you. My Republican women friends, same thing. One of them posted today, I stayed home and I raised my kids for 15 years and I'm not even a human being on the face of the earth. That's how Republican, they're all Cinderella's. They are still looking for the man to come and da, da, da. It's stuck in the 50s. It's a generation difference. And, and progressives, you know, I, I, and I'm certainly not saying anything, you know, look at staying home and raising kids. To me, that's the hardest job in the world, you know, have at it. But, but, but the symbolism of that statement by a very high up Republican family's daughter. I thought he was talking about, and I can't believe I'm t- treating Trump statements like they're serious, but um, <laughs> I thought he was not saying, he was not extolling the virtues of women staying home and no, he wasn't. No, I brought that domestic up. life. Yeah. What he was no, no, saying no. No, is no, that right. in today's, you know, the subtext was in today's politically correct men world. Are too men, easily, uh, yeah, men are too easily accused and, you know, you look the wrong way and you can have a rape charge. Right, I mean, it's, right. It's, I, yeah, for sure. It's a ridiculous cartoonish version of reality. But but there I, are a whole do, lot of men who still I think who there feel are a whole that lot way. Of moms. I think there are a lot of moms who feel that way. And uh, it's not justified, but... Uh, um, I mean, uh, first of all, how many people are really charged with this kind of thing? Uh, and it ser- turns out that very no, no, I don't really think it's grounded in reality. I don't think right, it's right, a right, big right. problem. But he but played I do to think an the high pro- I do think the high-profile sort of ambiguous sexual assault cases at some of the major universities has um, created this impression, a false impression, but an impression nonetheless that. Uh, men can be easily charged with sexual assault. And then you get into women forever have been, uh, you know, sexually assaulted. I totally agree. No, I know you do. I just want to state it for (laughs) the obvious that I'm not sitting here and going, "Uh uh-huh, I'm fighting back, you know, so that that, that my listeners understand where I am on this and, 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 and what the dilemma is. This is the crux of it, and this may be at the heart of. And if Kavanaugh goes through, by the way, it stamps the thing. Nothing has changed. A woman can come forward, be reasonable, be brilliant, be, you know, uh, even Trump said that she was, what were his two words, you know, uh, uh, credible, uh, and et cetera, and still is ignored and is still ignored. And he gets on the bench. Sorry, that sets us back by t- about, you know, 50,975 yeah. uh, years. Ign- not ignored, but dismissed. It's the same thing. I mean, there's a and difference. It's, and, right. it's, and they're both bad, uh, either way that, that, that you look at it. And it's, it's irritating as hell. I mean... Uh, look, I... I um, we're getting nowhere fast, darling. That's what I'm trying to no, say. We're getting nowhere no, no, fast. Look, uh, you mean in terms of the country's attitudes yeah, on, on yeah, sexual yeah. assault? Uh, on 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 where women belong in society. I mean, I think we're, we're, we're you know, for all the gains that we made, uh, make we're not now. That'll change when Congress changes, by the way. But but it's only going to be one side of the aisle that's changing because uh, Republicans. Yeah, well, are still I, I be think um, you know, I think the Clinton campaign did demonstrate a lot of sexism in American life that you know. Oh, well, for sure, I a mean, lot of people didn't. Yeah. I think realize was there and. Um, you know, I think if someone told you 30 years ago we'd have a black president before we had a woman president, you probably wouldn't have believed it. I wouldn't have believed it. No, 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 absolutely. Um, I want to go into Michael Avenatti again. We talked about him briefly the other day, but the reason I wanted to bring it up is because this really has backfired on him. Uh, they're playing him yeah. for because uh, uh, what Trump's dirty-haired guy, you know, who was on uh, Bill Maher the other night. I always forget his name. Yeah, Bannon. Thank you. Said the one person that Trump should be afraid of was Michael Avenatti. So, you know, they've now gone, no matter what Avenatti says, they're going to make mincemeat out of her. But if you watched her, uh, she was odd. 
Miss Julie Swetnick. And now, uh, you know, I, there's more to the story than meets the eyes we discussed, I think, off air, which is now there are new charges saying that she liked group sex and yada, yada, yada. Not that that has anything yeah. to do with anything, but, you know, they're beating up on him and they're beating. Are the Republicans just better at beating up? Well, that's an excellent question. You know, I mean, uh, you know, a lot of Republicans will say that, you know, Kavanaugh got pummeled around. Just going back to Avenatti, I mean, I. Yeah, I'm surprised that someone who's been pretty careful in a high risk in a bunch of high risk cases was so um does not seem to have vetted his client very well. Uh now she could be telling the truth that as as you say, you know, even if the group sex thing is true, it's it's hardly says anything about whether one was assaulted, but he has not put forward the best case. And uh, I'm a little surprised by that. Okay, Lindsey Graham, office rocker. I think there's an interesting thing here. I think he really is outraged that he voted for Cake and then Sotomayor and got primaried and feels like he's been good to the Democrats and has just taken this thing very personally. Uh but that doesn't mean he's not off his rocker. I kind of think he is a little off his rocker. But I think the, I think there's there's a backstory here that's kind of interesting about where he sees himself in the world, and um, you know, he sees himself as Mister Reasonable, and he's been done wrong. But his performance. Yeah. But you know what? I think he saved Kavanaugh. I think during the break when he went out there and talked to reporters and punched hard and punched hard at that hearing. I think he did a lot to rally people. Well, he did for the, the moment, right. and then he must have had an absolute conniption fit when Flake and, and uh, uh, what's his name, got together and, and cut the deal. I think that at that point, because he's gotten even more outrageous as the days have gone on since that. I mean, he thought he gave the oh, performance yeah. of the life, and, and you, know, it's like, uh, the, you know, it's like a star is born. The next second, Jeff Flake. Can we talk Jeff Flake real quickly? Because here's something that I've heard from my end. I don't know if you've heard it. I have heard, I I thought he was a hero. Sure, he's not going back to Congress, but that didn't stop him before. You watched him. You watched him get in that elevator. You watched those women, you know, attack him. You watched him come back in the room. You watched his face. This guy did something that that the people in Congress don't do anymore. He was feeling. He was absolutely feeling. And, oh, my gosh. He changed history because, you know, who knows what's going to happen next. Oh, yeah, but absolutely. Was, he used his leverage. I mean, they all have this kind of leverage in a closely divided state. And, and he figured it out. And what I want to say to you is how many people I've heard, Matt, and tell me if you've heard the same thing, say, oh, no, he just, you know, he played it for his own game. Oh, that well, made me mad. Somebody <sighs> finally did something right. It's hard, to, he, it's hard to figure out what his game is, as you say. He's, he's not uh, been kind of forced into retirement. Um uh, you know, uh, well, maybe it was I think he. Put, I think you know uh, that Ben Sass doesn't look so. Oh, he looks terrible. He doesn't look like Mister Thoughtful anymore. You know, he had nothing interesting to say during all this. The other one who I thought was a bore, by the way, was Cory Booker. But hey, you don't want to hear me on that. My next question, very quickly, is who were the stars of the whole thing, and who have been the uh, not so star? Well, I got to say, Klobuchar was. I think. Uh, the yeah. kind of virtuoso on the dam in terms of being tough but seeming reasonable, keeping her poise when Kavanaugh was wacko. She's a trained prosecutor from uh, Hennepin County up in um, Minnesota, and she she showed it. And I just think um, she was very, very good at, at what she did. And I thought Harris was pretty good. Um, and Durbin was very good. Yeah, I Durbin, thought. I thought, was terrific. I thought... Uh, yeah, on the Republican side, you know, I mean, I think they were all singing from the same hymnal, so there wasn't a lot of uh, no stars born. Lot of diff- okay. No stars born, and Other you know, they like- all had. I mean, they all had this ridiculous line, like, you know, she's very believable. I believe she was assaulted somewhere at some time, <laughs> but she's clearly confused. You know, <laughs> mixed up. I mean, a bunch. She's of- just obviously something happened to her along the way, but she, you know, it. Uh, I didn't think any of them distinguished themselves. I mean, Kennedy's corn pone is, oh, is sort of 
amusing, if nothing else. But uh, Oh, and he spoke to a whole world out there, let me tell you what. I, I, and I thought Chris Coons was pretty amazing, and I also thought <laughs> Sheldon Whitehouse was was uh, yeah, White House was White House was very yeah. much the uh, the DA. Yeah. Um, but I thought, in terms of an appealing demeanor that that uh, walked the line between keeping the uh, the base of the party happy and appealing to the whole country, um, Klobuchar really uh, showed. I, I think she's probably the most talented senator in a lot of ways. I agree with you to- wholeheartedly. And by the way, if anybody would run, uh, uh, you know, for president. Um, <laughs> You know, out of that group, because I don't think the rest of them uh, have it yet. She she could, but you know, we could live in crazy times. The, uh, we can't run a woman. I'm sorry, because I think that a woman doesn't have a chance to, uh, of winning um, under all of this. So here's the deal. They get the FBI report. They get 24 hours maybe to take a look at it. And here we go again. Okay, take out your uh, Carmack the Magnificent hat. <laughs> Well, my Carmack is, uh, as I said before, I'm just, I'm just, I'm spitballing here. It's not based on anything other than a gut. I'm going to say Murkowski votes against, the rest vote for, he's in by a couple of votes. Okay. I mean, actually, he's in by Mike Pence breaking the tie. Okay. That's my, that's my guess. I don't know. You? Uh, I think we have another crazy round to go before we even get to the vote. I think the Dems, if they see a report that really is thin, are going to do something crazy. Uh, wonderfully crazy, rightfully crazy, but that's what I think is going to happen. And Possible. if it and does, you know, there's well, always the chance the FBI got something. Well, there is that, but, um, um, well, be, oh, and I'm glad that you brought that up because that, that should be the finishing thing that we go to today. If they do get something, here is what Mr. Trump is going to say. He's going to say, the deep state came out for the Dems, and they drummed it up. That's what's going to happen. I think that could be. But, you know, I think there's a little, he allowed a little daylight between himself and Kavanaugh this week. Yeah, he did. That's true. I mean, he said Kavanaugh had problems with a young, as a young man with drink. <laughs> that's, yeah. not really, that's not really Kavanaugh's position. <laughs> no, but I'll tell you one thing that was pretty funny about that. You know, his brother died of alcoholism at a very young right. age, and so he, yeah. he never drank. And the at some level, well, I can't believe he really I, – I think it's probably unsettling to him. I, I would have to think it is, because that's the one thing in his life that we can look at, that Donald Trump, maybe his kids, Totally. The totally. Only, right. The only thing that meant anything to him in his life, and he stuck to Oh, me. yeah. The and grab then, and the woman, not right? as much. But, right. But, yeah. but the alcoholism and to have this going on uh, and him having to be in a position where he says, ah, it's just boys being boys. You know, that had to, like, uh, not be a good thing for him uh, uh, kind of thing. So we'll see. So you, And I agree, yes, he left a lot of wiggle room, room and all of that. To, so he can but go we'll see. Way. I mean, if they can get it, they're going to get it. If they can't they can't and if they can't by the way do you think that they can get somebody in up and running again what now Lindsay wants him to 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 reapply reapply for the job yeah (laughs) but uh, can they get someone by january well by by the first week in january no no no, by the midterm oh by the midterms no No, i don't i mean they can name someone but i don't think they're gonna be able to vet and do hearings and stuff um you know, unless it's a U.S. senator, you know, I, you know, right. If it's Jeff Sessions, oh. know, maybe it's he's a little old, so you know. Maybe it's what Lindsay wanted. If it's Mike Lee, Lindsay, I mean, or Lindsay, I mean, that's sort of the easiest path, you know. I mean, we know that Lindsay was trying out for AG. That was what that whole rant was about. Um, you know, that was his thing. Yeah. So I, hmm. I, you know, who who knows? I guess you know Amy Coney Barrett. You know, keep her phone. Oh my god! Ready. Oh my god! Well, I'm still I'm, I'm I'm leaving us with the thought that I maybe it's just because I'm hoping they do it, but I think they can't. If the Dems fold and say, "Okay, that's all," and they only lose it by one vote, that's not a good picture for the Dems to go into the midterms with. I think they have to do something pretty insane. Um, I don't know what they got in there. Well, we didn't, we didn't know that they had her. So hey. Well, it's true. Right? Well, let's. Uh, I'll leave you the la- I'll leave you the closing line, my love. Go for it. Um, 
Well, I think it's going to be a very sad day for the FBI or the country if they come up with the Finn report and then a few days later there's stuff that comes out about him right after confirmation. There it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Matthew. Thank you. <laughs> Let's talk to you next week. Hallie. Matthew. <laughs> Dear. I've been speaking with journalist Matthew Cooper. You can read his insightful reporting at Washingtonian.com and follow him on Twitter on Matt is Coop and on Facebook at Matthew Cooper. listening to the Hallie Kesser Jane Show. My guest today is veteran White House correspondent and contributing editor to Washingtonian Magazine, Matthew Cooper, my co-host on Podcast America, and the author of a brand new fabulous book, 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, A Life-Changing List, James Mustick. The Hallie Kesser Jane Show posts new podcasts Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern at HallieKesserJane.com and is available wherever you listen to your podcasts. Be sure to find me on Google Podcasts, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, on all your favorite apps. You can find The Hallie Kesser Jane Show on your Alexa device, too. Just say The Hallie Kesser Jane Show. Oh, and come play with me on Twitter at The Hallie CJ Show. Love books? Me too. And do I have a book to recommend for you today? The title is 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, A Life-Changing List. The author, James Mustick, the co-founder of the acclaimed book catalog, A Common Reader. In his new catalog of the greatest books of all time, as compulsively readable, entertaining, surprising, and enlightening as the thousand books it recommends, organized A to Z by the author, the selections takes the reader on a roller coaster of entries. For example, Flora Thompson's Lark Rise to Candleford is followed by Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and then by the children's favorite, Eloise. The result is an unexpectedly revealing juxtaposition of literature packaged in a beautifully designed book, enlivened throughout with extensive illustrations, its compilation of brief yet informed and thought-provoking essays accompanying each title, giving the reader a sense of the world's historical and literary context, and a reason why the book is on the list. Extensive, intelligent, it's a lively library in a book in which readers of all ages will find books to add to their personal collections and to be read piles. It is the ultimate gift book for bibliophiles, a veritable treasure trove that brings reading back to the center of our cultural conversation. Let's talk with James Mustick. James, I treasure this. I am going to have this forever. What a wonderful book. This is just really... I mean, oh, thank you so much. Uh, really and truly. Uh, my first question has to be, of course, have you read each of the thousand books in your book? And <laughs> cruel me, do you have a favorite? I've read the vast majority of them. Uh, there are a handful that I have to admit, as I've thought about this, I've been a bookseller for a long time, and I've talked about many of these books so many times with readers in detailed ways that I'm familiar with them in a way that makes me believe I read them, but I'll bet you there's one or two or three that I, I may not have actually read, so that's in full disclosure. <laughs> but um, the vast majority of them I have, and I'm certainly familiar with them enough to credibly uh, present them to readers as, uh, as things that they want to take a look at. And your favorite? Well, my favorite, those changes from day to day, but I'll, I'll mention uh, one, which has been much on my mind because I've been giving it out to people uh, lately, is a novel by a man named Russell Hoban called The Mouse and His Child. Now, Russell Hoban is a very interesting writer. He wrote a series of books, uh, picture books for kids about a badger named Francis, <laughs> uh, uh, bedtime for Francis and Bread and Jam for Francis. And it's about this mischievous badger, and she's always getting in trouble with her parents or they can't get her to sleep. Those are lovely books. There's about five or six of those. And then he wrote kind of visionary novels for mature readers, the most famous of which is Ridley Walker. But The Mouse and His Child is for an age group um, 
of about 10 and 12. That's its intended audience. But it is one of the most uh, wonderful novels I've ever read, and I wouldn't qualify it by age. I think a reader of any age uh, who is imaginative will take great life lessons from this book. It's about uh, a wind-up toy, which are two mice attached together that you wind it up and the father lifts up the child. They get... um, they leave the toy shop where they're very happy and go out in the world and have these harrowing experiences uh, that end up being quite exhilarating. And it really, this is a book that says as much about what it means to, to be alive as any book I've ever read. Wow. And, uh, and so uh, that's at the top that's of my it. list. All you right. Know, right now. Okay. If we talk in six months, there may be something else. <laughs> I can relate to that. Believe me, I'm the same way. Look, I have to say, as I said, this is just delicious. It, it's, it's just a, a wonderful uh, thing to keep close to you. And I, I, I've, I've decided that I'm going to read one every day of the entries so that I get. Ah, thank you. Right? Isn't that a good idea? All right. So, so how did this all idea. come about? I mean, and, and, and how did you narrow it down to a thousand? Well, it came about. I. I, I had a, a mail order book catalog for 20 years, from uh, 1986 to 2006, where I read about books um, uh, for readers around the country, and uh, in similar ways to the way I write about them in the book. And readers would often write back to me, and this was before blogs and uh, and even the internet. And I still have. Uh, eight filing cabinets in my basement with all of these letters and then emails I'd get from readers uh, introducing me to books that they love that I didn't know about and so on. And so I was always doing something like this uh, professionally. Uh, and um, Peter Workman, the publisher of Workman Publishing, approached me with the idea of doing a thousand books to read before you die because he had published some other successful books in a series, uh, most notably A Thousand Places to See Before You Die by Patricia Schultz. And I said, um, you know, sure, I would love to do that, not quite uh, realizing what I was signing up for. <laughs> and uh, 14, 14 years later today, we published a book. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a long task. But wasn't and, it uh, fun? Didn't you have a good time doing it? Was. it? <laughs> well, it's, as with most writing, it's, it's fun after you've finished it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and torture um, in the middle. <laughs> I can relate uh, to that, too. Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, did the list remain the same? I mean, you, did you start off with a list, and then, or did, was this an evolutionary process? Oh, it was very much evolutionary. I started off with a list of about um, three or 4,000 books that I put together that I knew I wanted to consider. And then um, as I worked on it, uh, I'd learn about new books or I changed my mind or often in conversation, you know, once, once I embarked on this project and, and my wife and I would, would go out to a dinner party or, a, or, or uh, any kind of social gathering and people found out I was writing a book called A Thousand Books to Read Before You Die, I could never really enjoy myself in the same way because everyone would come, you know, who were readers would come running over to find out what was in the book, uh, <laughs> did I have their favorite author or their favorite book, and to make suggestions of other things, all of which had me feeling for a long time that no matter how much I had read or written about, I was still something of a slacker because somebody was always telling me something (laughs) new that I hadn't considered. And so it evolved a great deal and new books were being published. You know, there are books, uh, the first book chronologically in the book is the Epic of Gilgamesh, which was even before Homer. That was published about 4,000 years ago, but the most recent one was published last year uh, by a woman named Ellen Ullman, magnificent book about our life in the technological age called Life in Code, um, and so everything in between. So keeping up with new books as best I could and all of the suggestions I was getting and what I was discovering while I was researching made it a, an evolving project. Here's a thought that just comes to mind. Could you do another book that w- you could come up with another thousand books? Sure. Yeah, easy. I think, yeah, I think, I, I, I don't think it would be... Uh, uh, any lack of books, I think it would probably lack, you know, there's a core of reading in this book. Let's say Homer, Virgil, Dante, uh, Cervantes is Don Quixote, uh, Jane Austen, uh, Charles Dickens, Shakespeare, uh, and some other books from around the world, uh, The Tale of Genji, uh, and uh, that are kind of core works, the great Russian novels, Anna Karenina, and uh, 
the war and peace and crime and punishment. Yeah, how do you beat that? Uh, if we were to do another, if we do another <laughs> book of a thousand, um, that kind of anchor to the whole thing would be gone. Yeah. But you could certainly get a thousand books that are well worth reading to add to it. And one of the things we've done is we built a website called a thousand books to read dot com, which is one zero 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 books to read dot com, where people can review the list, they can uh, comment on it, they can add their own books into the conversation of books that I may have missed, because I think um, that's part of what I'm hoping to do is as I travel around to bookstores and libraries, talking to readers, is to provoke the conversation where people are. Um, looking at their own reading lives and adding to it and uh, advocating for the books that, that they want to share with friends. That's a great idea, and I'm glad that you mentioned it because I called um, our, our, our mutual friend who got this interview together and said, where am I supposed to send people? Because I didn't see it, but there it is, 1000-100-books.com. We'll say it again at the end of the show. I, I have to ask you this, James. I, you know, you got to read so much, which most of us, you know, we read some of this way back when we were kids, you know, in school and yada, yada, yada. It goes along the spectrum. But you've got a, a different perspective now, having gone through this. And I'm curious as to what you see uh, about writing, uh, the difference in writers of, of, of ago, of your, uh, as to contemporary writers now, um, more or less in command of the English language, how we use language, changes, fads, writing style fads, just like clothing and art. Uh, you know, we can go back and we can look at fads. Talk to me about writing and its changes over this broad. Uh, that is period. a great. Qu- that is a great question. Uh, I think um, I, I I I'm not um, in any way uh, on on the side of gloom and doom when it comes to that. I think there are many many marvelous writers today who are doing. Um, uh, growing the language, evolving the language in ways that are uh, as expressive and as articulate and as thoughtful as it's ever been. Um, so I think it's actually one of the areas of our culture. If you go into a bookstore, which there's so many uh, great independent bookstores across the country, they're thriving these days. There's so much just superb writing that it, it is. It's encouraging. It's almost it, it, there's a kind of thoughtful conversation going on between the writers and the pages that is missing from so much more of our society. So uh, I think um, uh, I, I feel I feel good about that. There are new forms coming up, like the graphic novel, uh, which I was a little slow myself to gravitate toward because uh, I was so uh, mired in the, in the traditional ways that just bring a new kind of energy to storytelling that speaks to more people. So I think that's encouraging as well. And I think we'll see as time goes by, even in digital forms uh, with things like um, Instagram or something, people are going to come up with new ways of telling stories that are closer to the old ways than we might imagine they might be. Because if you go to a, uh, for instance, a... um, uh, a cathedral in some town in Italy from uh, the Renaissance or, or or before, all of those frescoes on the walls are, you know, akin to graphic novels or finding images to express experience. Human experience, even though the accoutrements of it change, the core experience of birth, family, uh, growing up, uh, falling in love, falling out of love, having children, they don't change that much. And, uh, and so the, the, the mechanisms of telling that story may change a little bit on the surface, but I think deep down they're all mining the same ore. The thing that I find uh, with books today is uh, editing isn't what it used to be. <laughs> that, uh, you know, I, I, I have to say that is certainly true. I casting uh, no aspersions on my own editors on this book who have done a magnificent job with a lot of work, but I know I'm often kind of horrified when I'm reading a book and the uh, sentence structure right. isn't, uh, doesn't make any sense or there's just uh, grammatical or um, uh, typographical errors. Uh, so I think that is certainly true, and I think there's such a rush to get things into print these days um, that that... Uh, care has gone by the wayside. Fortunately, my yeah. pub, my <laughs> publisher, 
has been very patient for 14 years with the book, so they took the time to get it right when I finally delivered it. You also have to know that Workman puts out some of the best books ever. Every, almost every book that I have from Workman, I still have. I mean, it's just it's a yeah, the, yeah. He he was a genius, no question about it, and, and how he formatted and and uh, and, and the projects that that, uh, that he took on. Okay, just just answer. Don't give me an explanation. Favorite writer, okay, of all time. Favorite writer of all time, Charles Dickens. Okay, I'd be curious what you think that was the best book ever written, and I'm not sure that that's the same thing. The best book ever written. Now, there's that's a you know there's so many different angles. I'll tell you mine. Go ahead. The Great Gatsby. Oh well, that's a marvelous choice. That is a that is a perfect novel. It is perfect. Uh, Perfect writing, perfect novel, perfect storytelling. And I always say that uh, the great books of all time. You tell me if you agree. Are they're great stories, but they're great writing as well. And not that's hard to absolutely right. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, so I think, you know, if I had to pick one, I would pick the the Oresteia, the the Greek tragedies by Aeschylus, because it seems to me to encapsulate um, all of human experience very early on in in the historical time with the core values of, uh, or the core the challenges that human beings face. And and I, part of my affection for that, you asked me not to give an explanation, but I have to in this case, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, is oh, the best course I ever took in school, in college. Uh, a, a professor named Robert Fagels had just translated it. And uh, he, it was a magnificent translation. It's really the one I recommend for people to read. And in the course, we went through it line by line. So I got to know it so well. Uh, and to see its richness, and and uh, he would explain why he translated things a certain way. So, if I had to pick one, it would be that. Hmm. Interesting opportunity to meet any of the writers who are in the book now, and if not, who would you want to meet out of everybody, and what would you want to ask him or her? Um. Well, I'm, I'm going to pick a, a, a not really well known, although she should be better known writer. From around the year 1800 in France, uh, Madame de Stael, uh, S-T-A-E-L, uh, she was a formidable figure in uh, French society and in French intellectual life, and she was a real firebrand and uh, kind of invented the idea of, uh, of freelancing. Um, and she wrote a couple of novels, one of which is in my book. The novel is called Corrine. It's about this very independent woman who is really one of the first romantic heroes in a novel. And it's a woman, not a man, long before uh, Lord Byron or anybody else created romantic heroes. Um, and uh, she was an artist living in Rome. Uh, there's a, a, a love story. There's great writing. The book, the writing about Rome is so good that for years this novel was used as a travel guide. But the author uh, was just a figure that is everywhere you look when you read about that period. She's mentioned by characters in War and Peace. Um, there's uh, one writer of the time said that Napoleon had three formidable opponents, England, Russia, and Madame de Stael. And she... Um, wrote about every subject under the sun. She wrote about geography and politics and economics. The writing is all brilliant. Some of it is outdated or something, which is why the novels are, are, are the most interesting now. But it's just a fascinating figure um, that uh, more people should know about that I'd like to know more about. So I'd, I'd love to meet her mm-hmm. because every time I read about her, I want to know more. James, a lot of studies have been made uh, done, and, and one thing we do know uh, from those studies and book sales, I think, is that people don't read as much as they used to. And it, we also know that attention spans aren't what they are, once were. And I think this has had an effect on society in every way, shape, and form. And I, I, I'm curious, as, you, you sound like a positive guy. <laughs> so talk to me about that. Well, I think uh, two things. One, I think when it comes to reading books, yes, you're right. But on on the other hand, when when you think about it, people are reading now more than ever because they're reading on their phones, they're reading on you know social media, they're but they're not really reading; they're ingesting more and more stuff. 
And the distinction between stuff and real reading is what is of interest to me. Uh, because we spend so much time, as you were suggesting, on uh, social media or on the Internet and being distracted by things, the world is presented to us in um, these kind of in-the-moment news feeds where everything is urgent for you know, four minutes, and then it goes away, and something else comes in. And none of those uh, bits of information are placed in a context that gives them meaning. And so, to me, reading books is a place where we go, where we do have that context. We should have that context, where we can follow a thought from end to end, where our minds can wander, where we can talk to ourselves. And that's where we become, I think, more thoughtful and even more kind and more generous because we are taking the time to think about things or to let things, just to absorb things and to let them sit in our minds and become something else and to evolve in something. All of that is missing in the kind of distracted uh, reading the way information is presented to us, and it's also presented to us. We're not going out and finding it that much anymore, uh, which books allow us to do. So, uh, one of the you know the ultimate reasons I think people uh, should be reading more is to take back uh, the direction of their own minds and of their time and to be uh, reading more nutritiously, if you will. I love that, reading more nutritiously. My answer to you would be that we are dealing a lot in factoid today and not in imagination. And imagination is where we need to go. James, delightful to talk to you. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. I've been speaking with James Mustick. His book, 1,000 Books to Read Before You Die, a life-changing list. For more information, and to have some fun, visit 1000 Books to Read Before You Die.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to the Halle Caster Jane Show. The Halle Caster Jane Show is a production of Resec LLC. Be sure to tune in to The Hallie Caster Jane Show at HallieCasterJane.com or listen on your favorite app. New podcasts are posted Wednesdays, 3 p.m. Eastern. Mm-hmm.